I would remember. Well, how could you if it just erased your memory? That's not how it works. Now, how do you know how it works? Knock it off, okay? I'm interviewing you. No, you said that I'd be conducting the interview when I walked in here. Now, exactly. That's a clip from a fun YouTube video titled The Office as Zodiac Signs, where they play various clips from The Office. If you're like my family, you've kind of looked to as a port in the storm as we look for a way to get through this incredible medical tyranny that we're experiencing. But this theme of astrology is something that me and today's guest, Al from Forum Borealis, kind of rolled into as the preamble to our conversation. So I thought I'd play a little bit of that preamble. According to astrologers, the last time Jupiter, Saturn and Pluto were conjunct in Capricorn was 2000 years ago. Actually, a little over 3,000 years ago, and now it's hap it's happening again. Um, and uh, the triple conjunction was they interpreted last time it happened triggered the birth of the great empire of Babylon and the Sumerian people that went on to rule and dominate the world for many millennia after. So they're thinking this event could trigger a change that will have worldwide effects into the near future. We certainly see movements on the ground now but three uh, we experience yet another great triple conjunction now too um, because uh, the last one okay it just lasted a few months this one we lost entire year 2021 and that's super rare uh, and it marks significant and great change that that, for example, when they, uh, when Buddha, Pythagoras, and Lao Tse came to the world was during this energy, just uh, last time. And when Saturn and Jupiter meet, it's called a great conjunction, uh, and they uh, occur like every 200 years or something. Uh, but now there is a third planet into the mix, and it all happens on winter solstice which is kind of interesting too and um, one last thing if you manage to see the crescent moon past jupiter and saturn this week you'll have noticed something else uh, about the uh, two largest planets they are now really really close to each other and yesterday they almost appear to collide to become one super bright point of light you can probably still see it in the night sky so uh, that's why they were called a double planet uh, in the Middle Ages. So it's all uh, it's all rather interesting. Uh, I, I never tend to think that you can predict directly. You you can look at the astrological map and you can look back and you can see oh this happened and look at what happened on the globe. Right, that's easy. But to do it ahead. I never trust that because it's so down to interpretations and there's so many various manifestations. So what what I'm sure of is something is going to change. Something is going to happen. But exactly what? I don't know. It could be good. It could be bad. It could be subtle. It could be overt. Yeah. I'm just trying to think how to process all that because I have a lot of different... Uh, you know, I've come to agree with the basic concept. I kind of approached it from a different way that you did. You're saying kind of a, a retrospective historical analysis. There's a correlation there that's undeniable. I mean, I think the other thing that people grab onto is just that their astrology sign matches their personality more often than it doesn't. And people will argue with that, and some people say they don't. But I think the general sense for most people is when they have a decent astrological reading, they're just like, wow, that is uncannily yeah. accurate in terms yeah. of who I am. I also agree with you in terms of the predictive power is uh, very, very weak in terms of <laughs> it's clouded by interpretation. But, you know, the, the interview that I did that really changed my mind is I interviewed a, and we talked about this before, so it's a little bit of a repeat, but we talk, I talked to uh, Renee Alsip, who is this super duper smart 
PhD, you know, statistics kind of genius who's also interested in astrology. And she did a statistical analysis of a particular orientation of the planets you were talking about and its correlation to followers. And she used Twitter as her model base, her data model for, you know, if people have this configuration in their chart, are they statistically more likely to have, you know, just a massive amount of followers? Mm. And the data was overwhelming. It was yeah. overwhelming in that yeah. in favor. Yeah. So here's the question I guess I'd lead. I, here's the question I guess I, I'd lead that up to mm -hmm. is that do you think we uh, uh, have this? We, we, how do we manage to disassociate that fact, you know, those couple of facts we just said about astrology from the larger thing that, of the implications of that, which is that we are connected to the whole freaking universe. I mean, that's yeah. what it's kind of in your face telling us. And we just play around with it like it's a toy, but it's yeah. the, the, the deeper, deeper implications are we're freaking connected. Yeah, and if we are, there should be ways to measure that. By the way, are we on? Have we started? Of course, this little clip here isn't really a good reflection of the entire show. Al, like I said, is a very deep guy. And every once in a while, he lays some absolutely paradigm-shifting nuggets on us. Like, how about this one? It's not about what system do we live in. It's about how many people accept the system we live in. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and today we welcome back. See, I stumbled on my own name because I have an <laughs> Al with me. But today we welcome back Al from the very excellent Forum Borealis. I always call him Al Borealis because he likes to stay stealthy with that last name. Al, if you've listened to the show, you know, we've connected a few times on his show and my show. And this is a guy I am always just blown away at the depth of his insights, the depth of his interviews. He's actually changed the style of my interviews sometimes and allows me to go a little bit deeper, which he is an absolute master at. So we just did a rolling introduction that I will include either at the beginning of the show or the back of the show, but we can come back and pick it up. But what I really wanted to do today, if he will allow it, is kind of turn this into a 2020 end of year review show and talk about some of our favorite and not so favorite moments on both Forum Borealis and Skeptica. And I thought that would be really fun. And I thought, it would just be a great, great person to do it with. I love this guy. Al, welcome back to Skeptico. Thank you, bro. I always love to discuss with you. We were just chatting a minute ago about mm -hmm. um, astrology. Yeah. And in particular, because we're recording this the day after the winter solstice. Yeah. And maybe you do want to recap for people a little bit, just from your understanding uh, how significant this winter solstice is and what it's, uh, you know, kind of bringing in. Now, uh, I'm going to have to play some of that because I don't want to repeat everything I said. and I don't want you to have to repeat everything you said. But first of all, help people understand where you're coming from. This is not like your thing, you know, that you no. do on a full time basis. You're just a curious person who sees some of this as being important, right? It's true, but I do have close friends who are masters of this craft, uh, known people since I was 16 who's deep into this. But what made it for me, you know, astrology is it's like any other unprotected field. If something is popular and it's not regulated, I'm not talking about from the state, but at least from the industry itself, from the skilled people itself, anyone can call themselves an astrologer. So I'd say, and I'm I'm probably being generous, but I'd say probably 80% of the people who practice this are clueless. They're into it for all the wrong reasons. 
So uh, the chances for an average Joe who has no clue about Astro getting some decent input on Astro is very low because first off, they don't even have a tool to know how to get a good astrologer if they even could get one. <laughs> the best ones don't uh, waste time giving readings. But back to the point, what did it for me? It was actually science. Three different, or, or maybe I should include four, uh, include uh, studies on cycles, but there are at least three different scientific uh, evidences for correlations, if not causations, because causations isn't important here. It's not, you don't have to believe that a planet is beaming a ray into your skull and making you act like a robot. I mean, you could go for that medieval view, but my point is that if everything in existence is following laws, laws of nature, laws of whatever, then and everything is following rhythms then uh, uh, and phases and cycles, then you can use the heavens as a mirror, as a map, and if you do that uh, over enough time, like the Mayans did, like the Babylonians did, like the Chinese did, like everyone's done, Indians, so you see, oh, hmm, here's some changes in the heavens. And look, look, folks, there's some changes going on in Earth too. Now, after a hundred years, thousand years, oh, look, it's the same kind of changes happening when it's the same kind of um, move, uh, changes going on on Earth. So it's as above, so below. So... What's the chicken? What's the egg? What's influencing what? If if not, indeed, both are following a mutual, deeper causation. But that's not the important thing. What's the causation? There is an undisputed correlation. And I'm not just saying that for my own personal conviction. I'm saying that because of scientific evidence. I have three different uh, books, scientific reports about this, plus books about cycles. And it's all very known for those who want to know. One of them, very famous, and this kind of research was done mostly before, because nowadays skeptics, pseudoskepticists have taken over most of science. But in the 70s, they were very good. Uh, and one of them, Michel Gauguin, I think is his name, a Frenchman, he even killed himself because no matter how much good info he threw on the table, Look, look at the facts, folks. Look at the facts. Didn't help. Ad hominem, ad hominem, ad hominem. Everyone went after him. It's the same old tune. We've heard it a thousand times, and you've covered it many times in your excellent shows. Every time a scientist steps outside of the accepted paradigm, paradigm, folks, not the research, not the methodology, but paradigm, and prove something with it. it if it debunks something with it that's okay you can go outside the paradigm and debunk but if you prove something you got to you got to bring him down so that's my uh, my in general why i'm but then i have a personal element i used chemistry horoscopes which means you make two charts one uh, where you make one chart but you base it upon two different people it doesn't even have to be people it can be you and an event or whatever but you make a, a like a chemistry reading and i did that for decades i did that in, in connection with dating <laughs> the best motivation in the world man because you 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 don't accept any excuses <laughs> just tangible results right and indeed I, I did get that so so after that it was a close case for me done deal there, there's so many interesting parts about that and we were chatting about it be, before so uh I'm, i am going to repeat a little bit of that because you know science is going to have to be one of the things we talk about mm. today because i think 2020 in a year in review was kind of the the final assault on science as i see it it was the final mm. breakdown of like we don't even need science. We're just past these edicts and just say stuff and just mm -hmm. in your face, you know, we don't care about the science, but like there's so many subtle shades to it that, uh, that need to be understood. I know some people are going to react to when you say uh, causation doesn't matter, but I think you're, you're yeah, just absolutely spot on in, Here's the bigger picture for me from a scientific standpoint is that one, a correlation is the beginning of all scientific inquiry. 
<laughs> I mean, yeah, that, yeah. that is called observation. We mm-hmm. observe something that seems to be correlated with something else, and that begins our observation. So on astrology, you know, the, the people that, that kind of don't understand the correlation thing and the critics will point to, well, you know, every year this uh, insurance company will say, which drivers are the most accident prone? And they'll say Capricorn. And then they'll go, ha, 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 we were just data mining. Every year it changes. We just take the statistical most accidents by this age, by this uh, date, you know, and da, da, da. Well, so they are correct in pointing out how, uh, correlation can be misapplied. But what they're losing sight of is that fundamentally, statistics are about correlation properly applied. So when I said a minute ago about the research that, you know, really impressed me of Renee Alsop who was on the show and did this very uh, refined, peer and peer-reviewed uh, sophisticated Monte Carlo statistical kind of thing, you know, all this stuff that's way over my head, but you can read it and at least say that person knows what they're talking about because they reached my stati- my limit of my understanding of statistics. And that was like in the first two sentences. But what she found was a, a highly statistical, sig- highly statistically significant correlation between a particular uh, planet correlation, you know, the, what you were talking uh, 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 planet juxtaposition, planet alignment, and the extent to which those people who had that in their chart would have a lot of followers, a massive amount of followers on Twitter. So mm-hmm. I guess I'm just trying to uh, back up what you're saying, because I think it's it's a super important point, And it's about the subtleties of science that at this point, you know, I, I don't know. I... <clears throat> I just don't seem to be having those kind of conversations anymore with people. Science has been degraded down to the point where you can't separate out uh, these methodological issues and, and, and these these other uh, social issues that come along with the baggage of science. So maybe we want to talk about that for a minute, just in terms of how uh, how science is under under attack yeah but let me just say about the correlation causation thing that uh, of course it matters what's the causation if you really want to crack open the mechanism or something uh, but in terms of just knowing that astrology or i i, I prefer the word astrosophy to distinguish it from the trash astrology but to know that that works, even though we may have not have mapped every ounce and aspect of it, um, then you just need a correlation. It's it's the same as you can, you know, if you talk with a nurse, she will tell you, yes, it's true. I, I guess we could talk about it from a couple of different ways, but one, yeah, and, and this is kind of the geeky sciencey stuff, though, that is interesting to me in, in having these kind of conversations, because you realize how this is so often left off the table when someone says, wear a mask, don't wear a mask, and you go, well, where's your scientific evidence for how that is efficacious in the real world. And you do have to break those things down. So I'd go back to correlation causation. I would say we will never know the causation of everything because from an occulted standpoint, from an extended consciousness standpoint, you know, one of the things that's my first book, why science is wrong is we will never know that completely. So yes, we can add more and more, uh, causations as control mechanisms, but we only like them because they have a high, higher degree of correlation with the outcome, right? So if we say, gee, you know, when it rains, the plants grow and we go and test that, we find that the, the, the rainfall is highly correlated with the, the plants growth. Mm. And then we find some biological reason for that, but we also have other things that we've left out, you know, like someone was giving an intention to have that particular crop grow. Well, we didn't factor that in. Mm. So we can't really say that we've totally nailed the causation. All we can say is we've identified some causative elements that are highly correlated with the outcome we want. So I, I, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. I'm just saying that a lot of times, 
the, this smirky uh, scientific materialism that we've all just come to to completely distrust because it's completely fake has always been fake. And we've just been kind of conditioned yeah. by their language to kind of accept what they're saying a, a lot more than we probably should. And this year is the final insult, you know, 2020. Yeah, yeah. No, but that's normal. Uh, there's always been a clash between the th- those theorizations and, you know, pra- practice. Because uh, I was about to say, like, if you ask a nurse, she'll tell you that, yeah, it's true. Uh, on the full moon, more babies are born. And under Dark Moon, the opposite, more people die. And so they always have more um, baby nurses. What's it called? So they have more midwives and birth nurses at work every full moon. And at every Dark Moon, they have more of those who uh, work with death at work because they know in advance it will happen. They don't care why. And there may come some kind of egghead in and say, no, this is superstition and it has nothing to do with the moon and blah, blah, blah. But he could say that to women too in terms of menstruation, right? But they wouldn't listen to him. They would probably indulge him. But as soon as he was gone, they would go back to, you know, business as usual. More people at work then. So that's what I'm saying from a practical standpoint. If there is a correlation, we can work with that. The question of causation is more important because then it's not just, you know, uh, everyday life, how are we relating to it? Then it's understanding why is it uh, so we can change it or manipulate it somehow. So, yeah, that's when real science enter in. And that's where they can get away with things because you're very right. The ultimate causations and as an esoterician, that's what we're working with, right? So the ultimate causations, I mean, Kant explained, Immanuel Kant explained that to us long ago. The thing in itself, you can never really know. You can know the thing in you, which the thing in itself has to be filtered through in order to um, be recognized, perceived, whatever. And so it's true. We cannot, uh, that's because existence is rigged against us. It's rigged against us in the way that we only have five windows. Maybe you could argue we have a six one, which is half open, but we have only five windows between ourselves, which is the ultimate reality, and the world. Those five windows, those five senses are super limited. And we are so ingenious because we create tools to broaden them more so we can know more what's going on that's for example an x-ray machine does that but then on the other hand we're so stupid too human beings that we try to fill those frequencies that we normally don't interact with as in 5g right where we pollute and you know the problem then and then that's one we have to discuss causation is what what uh, key, um, backlash does it give and if you can't immediately uncover it and document it 100% then uh, they can get away with it because you know it, it's so hard to find real causations and, and that's so much crime is getting away with it so but in terms of the pandemic I think there's different causations going on <laughs> and then the correlations are you know whatever the total balance of those different uh, inputs, com- uh, when they come and play together, they find some kind of um, way to, you know, it's like different waves being clashed into each other. And wherever is the midpoint, that's that's the uh, correlation we are, find ourselves in. But tell me what you mean there. Let's, I, I wasn't... this. This isn't really where I was planning on going, but let's let's go there. Let's talk about the pandemic. It was obviously one of the most important events of 2020. Your shows were instrumental to my coming to grips with it pretty early on because I'll just maybe you can tell us, you know, what shows you've done on the pandemic and how it impacted you, but uh to, and then I can offer I can offer my opinion, but go go ahead. Tell us tell us how you covered it and how you covered it from the beginning of the year through the end of the year and where you come down on it now. 
Okay, and after that, you tell me how you covered it. So how I covered it was that I, I really didn't want to touch it at first because it was a 24-hour news cycle. Right. Right? We were all fed up. But then I realized, damn, I can't stay silent on this. Uh, so I started making some shows. And interestingly, <laughs> as many people said, Al, Al, we come to you to, to get away from all this shit. That's when I realized, oh, damn, that's a good uh, function to have. So, but I had to cover the basics of it. So I started with, uh, f- with our mutual friend, Robert Bonomo, because I wanted to have a... Uh, First, the financial aspect. And that's because before the pandemic, and I was one of the few voices out there who touched it, but it was completely ignored in a shame stream press and also in the independent media, almost no focus. But that's that the economy was crashing before the pandemic. And of course, the pandemic just escalated it even worse. In fact, before the pandemic... Half a year before the pandemic, the Fed Federal Reserve was pumping one trillion dollar a day into the stock market to make it afloat. But you don't hear about that. So we we had a show called The Money Game, MMT, UBI, and the Corona Crash. Then I covered the virus itself in a show called What You Should Know About the Pandemic. And there I... Um, uh, focused on the more sin because you you notice there's like two different uh, polarities in the counterculture media about this. One is the pandemic thing, uh, nothing to see here, folks. It's all a scam. Move on. And the other is this is a, either a deliberate or an accidental bioweapon lab spill. And it's not an either or, but uh, let me just say the third aspect, the third show I did, uh, which was probably your favorite, that was with the investi- uh, independent research investigative journalist uh, George Webb, called "Spooky Aspects of COVID." Who, who was the second one? Who was the second one with again? It was a doctor. Uh... Yeah, Doctor Apsley, uh, great guy. So, um, and the third was George Webb, "Spooky Aspects," and there we went into. Actually, a little bit about to follow the money, a little about about the virus, a little about how this is planned. But in my world, all this can be uh, reconciled because you know as well as me that the shock doctrine has never been more in use than now. They tested it out first in foreign countries, and then after a while, they started implementing it on uh, American citizens too, like nine eleven, etc. You could even argue JFK was kind of a shock doctrine. So what they do, whether you believe that the cave Arabs with box cutters was behind the whole thing in 2001, or you don't, the fact is that when something like that happens, they seize upon it. They seize upon it with pre-planned and pre-tested scenarios. It's not It's not like invented on the spot. They have plans they want to implement and they've had it for years and they still do. And we all know what that is. And so every time something shocks the population, because, you know, the battle isn't happening in the independent areas. That's where the people are had, having their heads up their asses. That, that's what they think they are in their own bubbles. Bubbles are the big problem today. Echo chambers and bubbles for everyone, not just the independent. But the real battle is how many of the sleepwalkers can we reach? And the thumb rule has always been for the powers that be anywhere, anytime, that you need to pacify a certain amount. There's two ways to do it either by brutal force, which was very popular in the past, which is very risky and dangerous because the backlash is so bad. I mean, it's the guillotine and and, and, an even worse regime after that. The other way is to pacify them, you know, the Hollywood style. it's, It's basically 1984 versus Brave New World. So Brave New World, keep them happy. Keep them uh, fed and, uh, you know, throw them some bones and let them play with that. 
Now, the oligarch of today has forgotten all the lessons. I mean, um, your great uh, president uh, uh, in the 30s and the 40s who brought you out of the Depression uh, brought in the New Deal. And he was criticized. Oh, you're a goddamn, you're yielding to to the socialists and uh, Soviet and whatnot. No, no, he said. (laughs) I, I saved capitalism because he understood we cannot... Uh, uh, you know, just destroy the whole middle class. So, so say, but that lesson has been uh, forgotten now. We're in the exact same situation and now they're making it worse. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. But uh, I talked myself away from the point. Um, sorry. Uh, well, well, then maybe, maybe you need to push on through. So what are you really saying there in terms of you know, the Roosevelt's New Deal versus the current global financial reset that a lot of people are talking about. Yeah. So if I can connect your dots, Thank you. you're talking about our friend Robert Bonomo saying, you know, hey, the thing doesn't really float. You know, we have these, we were comfortable with the term zombie banks. Well, now we have zombie nations of which the U.S. is one, and virtually every country in Europe is one. So, you know, how does that really go? Yeah, it's very evident right now, because in America, in in Europe, they keep us throwing us toys so we can sleep on. Everybody is getting bailed out, which, of course, when you force a lockdown on society. Hold on, because I I did want to kind of get to the end point here, which is what I never hear anyone talking about. So everyone gets to this point that you're talking about, and then the conversation just kind of peters out or it just goes, okay, so they're going to do a a reset. You know, the other way to do a reset is war, right? Yeah. I mean, you go to war with China, you got a reset, right? I mean, because you a, a, a straight up war. You say, okay, well, you're holding all the chips, but what you're really holding, ha ha ha, is just notes against us. Against us. So now we say, screw you. We're not honoring any of the notes. Game over. So that's another way to do the reset. And I'm not advocating any of this people. I'm just saying, why don't that, that seems to be off the table. It's always like, oh my gosh, we're just printing more money. It's like, well, so what? Do you know that? Why is that necessarily ever going to there, there's there's a couple of ways to solve that problem and the the it's not it isn't necessarily uh you know this very global uh, agenda driven reset and i i hate when we start using that language again and again i'm not advocating i'm just saying that isn't the only solution mm. no i i agree but um first off i want to just say I was go- getting originally to the point that, uh, you know, virus vs. pandemic, it may be both. There may have been an actual spill and they may have seen it and they s- then seized upon it with the pandemic. You see what I mean? So it doesn't mean that, oh, there's no th- such thing as COVID and, oh, you don't worry if you get it. It may still be serious. And on the other hand, yes, it may be exploited for a more sinister political purpose because that's what they do with crisis. They take them and they try to shape. Because here's the thing. I was talking about the fight to win over the uh, sleepwalkers. I, I always have that in mind that there may be sleepwalkers listening to me. So I always need to reach them. I don't want to get too esoteric uh, unless that's the whole point with the show. So uh, and that's brilliant opportunities for the powers that be because they could never lock down stuff under normal circumstances. The sleepwalkers wouldn't uh, allow it because that would shook them so much that they would realize, oh my God, the world isn't as safe and comfortable and simple as I I desperately wanted to believe. I'm feeling it on my own body now. And that's uh, always good grounds for revolutions and reforms and changes from below because that's when everybody is losing. They're waking up, right? This oh, I've been hypnotized. I've been a zombie. Okay, come with us, boys. Let's fight the man. But the man does the same. 9-11 and now. The majority are uh, full of fear and disoriented and that's when you shovel down before they get to think about anything or organize or anything, you shovel down through their throat insane measures that never could have 
gone through under normal so circumstances. So that's the big battle in crisis like this to win over the, the sleepwalkers. Now, to what you said. In the EU... Can we pause there for a second and talk about sleepwalkers? Because... You know, this is going to be this is going to be our, our classic kind of conversation. It could just kind of go on endlessly in all these different directions. But your point, I think, is so so important. And again, I would because that's mom up skeptical. I'd have a slightly different perspective on that. One, and tell me what you think. Mm -hmm. But I I will bet you anything. Your experience is the same. It's not so much that we are waking the sleepwalker. It's that we happen to be around when they wake up, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because the, the, the resistance to waking up is so strong, <clears throat> and particularly from a spiritual perspective. You know, this is like a deeply ingrained pattern that might even span lifetimes, we have to suspect for a lot of people, because we see them, and it is so deeply ingrained, they can be given piles and piles of evidence, and it just does not change them. We need to look no further than our religious institutions, you know, and it's like no matter uh, what is exposed, you just keep following that. There was a very famous book written, When Prophecy Fails, about cults, and you, that the, the, it would make prophetic predictions, and you would anticipate that when you say that the world is going to end on March 5th, and the world doesn't end on March 5th, you would say, well, that's probably the end of the cult. And what he found was exactly the opposite, that, Double yeah, a few down. people drifted yeah. away, but the majority double down. And that is the sleepwalker phenomena. So I think that what really is sleepwalking is about is we happen to be there when they wake up, which is kind of a neat thing. But I do so much agree with your other point, which is I always think us in the alt-alt community, which we are because we're not even the alt community anymore, we're the alt-alt community, <laughs> but we far underestimate the power that that is in the hands of the social engineers of the MK Ultra, uh, it, you know, educated MK. They went to the MK Ultra Institute 50 years ago, and they're so much further along than that. And the thing that the, the tagline I always use is they have not yet begun to fight. So if you think there's going to be this massive uh, waking up that is then going to kind of storm the gates of the castle with pitchforks and uh, torches, maybe. But I would say be ready for a lot of counterattacks from weaponry that they have stacked up that we haven't even begun to contemplate. What do you think? Oh, my God. This better be a three hours because I have an hour reply only to that one. <laughs> <laughs> but um, first off, you're very right. Uh, it doesn't mean that. For, first, no, first off, who's waking them up? You're right. It's not us. It's the material conditions, because we have a Maslow hierarchy of needs. And if you fuck with my ninth priority, I may let it go. I may, you know, it's not worth the fight. But if you fuck with my primary or secondary, I mean, I need food in my belly and I need roof over my head. And I need a whole lot of other things before I can sit down having this con convo with you. Alex, and so when they take that away or they shake it up for folks, and, 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 and you and me, we can handle. I mean, we can watch uh, horror movies and not flitch. We can we can be abducted by aliens and and ask, doesn't it go any faster? But if you just you know just uh, the, the the idea of a ghost to a sleepwalker is shaking them up in their core. So imagine how they are handling. Because their, their whole paradigm, I, I, it sounds so arrogant of us uh, to call them that. We are all sleepwalkers in different areas, okay? So it's all about waking up. Nobody's better than yes, others. Yes, good point. Yeah, yeah. But here's the thing. When it happens to them, because their value system and paradigm are 100% dependent on there's go not going to be a change. If there's change, is in, 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 in um, what you call it, uh, incrementalism. And Incremental. It's, yeah, incremental, and it's uh, it's just uh, abstract and theoretic. Yeah, it was the Russian Revolution in 1917, or the Black Plague. Yeah, I can get those concepts, but don't talk to me about... Ab Look at poor Graham Hancock. Why does those guys get so much? They have all the facts on their side, 
and they go after the man. That's because you're, you're, we are unpopular messengers, because they say, no, the world can just go under, you know, the, the driest period and all that debate. Overnight, they, they, they don't want to think about that. They're traumatized from Atlantis, okay? Because astrology is just like the genes. It's just a map. It's not the genes driving me. It's a correlation. And however I experience life influences my genes. And it's the same thing with uh, astrology, just to close that uh, debate. That was a callback. Now to uh, the current debate. So it's about... Uh, the material conditions and then yes you're right Uh, many will double down that's a very good point you made you'll see because they're not ready to come out and admit that you know they have been in a lie in an illusion so they have to fight even harder no you have to wear a mask or I go down kill you or you have to take the vaccine yes give me a chip yes so so they become they are fascistoid as Willem Reich proved in his book the function of the orgasm, it's very connected to our uh, character and psychological design. Now, even those guys have a, a hard limit, and I'll give you an example of where that's been passed just now lately. But I also want to point before the, out before that, that even though many double down and become like crazy cultists for that big cult called society, we get record numbers over to our side, which that means in broad terms, the counterculture side. And I'm not going left, right here because that whole thing in itself is, is kind of an illusion. Or It's not an illusion, it's a distraction because it's true in culture as matters, in values, but not on the primary matters. And that's where populism has to band together because, for example, if you're a right-wing populist, you are against wars, but mainly so because you don't want to fuck up other countries because you're a nationalist and you don't want other countries to fuck up your own. You realize that. Plus, you don't want the blowback of a million uh, refugees, etc., or, or the bad karma. What you, plus, you don't want the money to go to war industry. You want it to go to build up your own country that you love and, and yourself that you need to stay alive. Now, if you're at the left, you will probably have more... Um, emotional and ideal idealist reasons for it it could be in general like you're like buddhism oh i'm against you know i'm a pacifist i'm against hurting others anyway or, and you can share some uh, like you you want the money to be spent in your own country for you know social welfare whatever so if you can get those two guys to f- fight of, of, over you know cultural issues or, or identity you know uh, gender issues or abortion bam you win and this i don't i know i'm flogging a dead horse we've been down this road many times so let's just uh, put that to the side now in europe well, well but hold on hold on that yeah. was that was absolutely brilliant i don't care how many times uh we've we've covered it or it's been said you you very succinctly I think, captured something there that's awesome. I I loved hearing it. So please continue. Okay, cool. Because uh, I believe we can coalite, not just across left and right wing, but across everything. But it's not about our differences. That's what they want to point out. We have to point to the goals. So if people, let's say, love freedom. Let me pull you back in a different direction here. (laughs) Let me... uh, piss on all that, which I, I kind of like to do sometimes because sure. I am That's such fun. an idealist. I am such a, 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 an advocate of just life and love and, and prosperity on a personal level as, as well as every other level. Level, So I so resonate with what you're saying because it's so optimistic. But let me be less optimistic okay. and let me return to the point of they have not yet begun to fight because as you alluded to some of the tools at their disposal is like this identity politics, right? They, they can play, they can undermine your glorious strategy as they have so effectively with just something as simple as identity politics. And it's completely uh, effective. I get it. I agree with you. But let me give you even more hope from because we have to be scientific and not idealistic when we discuss this. So I'll back up uh, my points from reality, not from my wish list. If it was my wish list we were discussing, I will paint an even better picture for you. 
So let's let's uh, anchor this in reality. Just these days here, something interesting have happened on American left because you know I make a point out of not being in an echo chamber. So unlike most people in the independent field, I think unlike most, I think I'm in a minority. I deliberately keep oriented uh, in all areas of existence that I, uh, you know, can, you know, within my resources. And politically, I keep an eye both on the left and the right because there's interesting things going on in both. And right now, as we speak, you know, uh, 80% of Americans want a universal healthcare system. It's just Nigeria and USA who hasn't got it yet. And that's 80% of. no, uh, so, sorry, it's 70% of American, it's 89% of Democrats, it's 55% of Republicans, and I don't remember the number for independents. But if the overall number is 70%, then uh, the math is there. Now, politicians, it's the opposite. You'll find a handful who probably support, let's say, Bernie's version of Medicare for all. Because, make no mistake, folks, universal health care, comes in five different versions from a left-wing solutions like UK and the NHS to a right-wing solution, which is what they in America called uh, the uh, pub- public option. Now, that's not what America has. You have corporatism and no politician is backing it. And you ha- hear a lot of voices on the left saying they want it. Well, Look at what just happened. Jimmy Dore, that loose cannon. You have to love the guy. He's the Alex Jones of the left. And he has now exposed uh, one of the biggest independent networks out there. That Well, the thing is, they're not independent anymore, namely the Young Turks. They were, once upon a time, pretty innovative and independent, but long ago been mainstream. And they're in Hillary Clinton's pocket and the establishment Democrats. And he's exposing it live. And he's turned 80% of the of the Young Turks uh, audience against them. Why? Because he is now find himself accidentally at the spearhead of a campaign to expose the so-called progressive left politicians like the squad, AOC, and all the new ones that are coming in. Because, and Bernie Sanders too, because they're not fighting for Medicare for all. Because Nancy Pelosi, that old cunt, can I, sorry, uh, beep that. But she's disgusting. And she, they want AOC and those guys to force her to have a floor vote on Medicare for all. Not that it's going to pass, but they want to see which politicians in both parties that are actually going to block it in the middle of a goddamn depression where people lose their jobs. And for some weird reason, jobs are, to, uh, are attached to healthcare in America, which keeps them, you know, slaves attached to their jobs and not seeking careers. But now they even lose that and they don't have healthcare and it's a depression and it's a goddamn pandemic. So. They want to see which politicians, because if you got, get those names down, they'll be destroyed uh, in the next elections. Because now people care because everybody wants it, because nobody. You, Alex, are upper class, so you don't feel the pain. But your brothers and sisters are really suffering now. 50% are about to lose their homes. And I'm not blaming any particular it's not like this is trump's fault or russia's fault or anything but it's congress it's is mostly to blame and that's democratic uh governed now they they have a leverage over nancy pelosi because she needs their votes just one vote can boycott her as the new speaker in the house she's going to renew although she promised to step down she's up for re-election and so they had leverage for the first time aoc and those people are leverage and what do they do Nothing, 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 nothing. They just, no, no. And you saw that in election too. They said, uh, no, no, support Biden, support Biden. He won't give you anything you want, but support Biden. And it's the same now. They're so loyal. And Jimmy Dore is not pushing and saying, people, if they don't withheld, do like the Tea Party did on the right, withhold their vote for Nancy Pelosi until she gives a floor vote on Medicare for all, then... Uh, we, we, they are all exposed as fake populists, and and, that's, and young Turks came out against it, but everybody is for it. 
And that's the positive thing, Alex. When you see sleepwalkers, because I, I believe there's at least as many stupid people on the left, on the American left, as or on the American right, if not more. And when you see they realize that everybody is a part of the game, the Young Turks, AOC, Nancy Pelosi, it's all, uh, it's either the establishment itself or they are controlled or blackmailed or, or seduced or pressured. So now it's a real populist uprising going on on the left. And not just in America. In India right now, there's 200 million people in the world's biggest general strike. Because when the media is sold, when the politicians are on the take, when every institu- democratic institution that we can use to implement the beautiful ideals you were describing that you share with everyone, no, mem- no matter their paradigm or their political affiliation or whatever, just freedom, basic prosperity, happy harmony, whatever, then people band together like they do now. And uh, Jimmy Dore is heading it and uh, it's the majority. And uh, they are now realizing it is a lie. And this can spill over to other areas too. But See, hold yeah. on a second, because this is going to be this might be a major rift, not really, but but just a, a, a dividing point in this discussion. Because, like to me, I'm so surprised that you would go with uh, universal health care. Because I think from my read of that, from where I sit in the alt alt community, is mm. that whole movement has taken about five steps back. Because we're now facing a medical tyranny that is unlike anything we could have anticipated. We didn't think they would get to this level of control with an all-out fake medical uh, oppression of people for 20 years. And they've accelerated. In the last year, they have it. I mean, vaccines are going to be mandatory to some extent, whether it's you can't fly on a plane or you can't go to the ball game or whatever the heck it is. Vaccines will be uh, mandatory. And once we're to that point, there really is no there really is no fallback. So I don't want to be any part of that medical system universal health care. I, I understand my brothers and sisters who are who are suffering, but I would suggest that they need to re-examine their life and see how they can more effectively withdraw from the phony, uh, tyrannical, and ineffective medical uh, system that we have. I, I don't know why we want to move no, no, towards that. Or, 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 no, 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 you misunderstand. Let me clarify. Okay, so I'm just talking about financing health. Uh, That can be done many different ways financially. But if you're talking about the contents of the health apparatus, that's actually another debate. And it's not tied automatically to finances. Because, for example, in UK, homeopathy... Can't separate them. Can't separate them. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll prove it. Uh, In UK, you have um, uh, homeopathy accepted as part of the public health care. So it's free, like at a point of service, like anything else. And that's because they have their own debates. Uh, the problem with uh, what you're pointing out isn't who's financing it. The problem is uh, that big multinational corporations, Pfizer, Monsanto, everyone, we, we know who they are. Not only are they the same as the owners, as the digital corporations and the military industry and media, but also they are calling the shots. So they don't want to give you universal health care because they want to price gouge. Every, you have a scam system. First off, you have a needless middleman, a mafia, the insurance companies who exploit it. Uh, and their interest is not to pay out. So even if when you have healthcare, you don't really have it as you experience when it manifests. But secondary, what do you want, Al? What do you want out of the healthcare system? I can, you know, if I, I fall down and break my arm, system. I, I want, want something. Hold on, I want something. 
I want something from, if I fall down and break my arm, break my leg, I want something from the healthcare system. Yeah. In all other situations, I can't think of anything I want from those fucking people. I have a heart attack. I'm not interested. I have a stroke. Not interested. I have cancer. I'm certainly not interested. What the fuck do I want from the fucking healthcare system? Immedi- okay. uh, uh, okay. Emergency yeah. triage. If I have a cut, if I cut myself in the, in the fucking kitchen with a knife. Yeah, I want them. I want to withdraw 90% fucking just cause they, uh, yeah, they're going to fucking placate the, the Brits with their homie, home op, homie, homeopathy, homeopathy, no, 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 no. whatever, you know, that's it's just, fight. That, it's yeah, just the bullshit. The I, I want to withdraw, cut the healthcare system by 90% no, and then I'm in. You misunderstand man. And I'll address your good points because I understand your, um, protests but they are misplaced because your concerns are not a problem if you break your leg it's who's going to finance the solution if you get cancer who's going to finance the solution here's the point you're saying you don't want to go to allopaths to treat that that's fine who says you you, the point is you're going to have expenses who's going to finance those expenses as it now stands uh, in the whole world, uh, it's not a profit. It's not a commodity. Like I'm a libertarian, I think that you should have an open marketplace, um, uh, market uh, town square kind of thing. If you invent something, it belongs to you. Internet was like this in the beginning; it was free, and that's how it should be. But the military should never be privatized to corporations and run by them. The police and the prisons should, but you have done it with the prisons, that's crazy. And the fire department should not be run, should not be a business. And the same with education and the same with health. Now, does it mean that uh, the state or some special interest group or some corporations are going to dictate the philosophy of that health system? No, because that's another matter. And today you don't have a state-run health system, and you still have those people in power, and they are also very influential here, but less, because they can price coach medicines in America. Like, you can go to Canada or Mexico and get it for one-tenth of the price because there's not a competition there about it. Uh, here in Norway, nobody has an interest in keeping me sick or, or, or refraining me from getting healthcare because of the insurance. But in America, there's so many poisonous incentives, there's so much criminality in the system that they have taken over the state. So the FDR, uh, food and drug, uh, is completely corrupt. And they are all influenced by the multinational corporation. And when they, they those people become politicians, they influence politicians, and those politicians work in those companies. So it's a revolving door. It's so that's special interests have taken over. It's not about who finances it. And you can have a system where you have insurance. This is the right wing system. You, you have private insurance, but it's a real competition among the insurance companies. It's not like now rigged. And those who can't afford it, it's not, it's not going to be tied to your job, by the way. It's just going to be tied to you, what you pay. And, what, and the jobs have... Uh, Al, I go back to my question. Yeah, yeah. What do you want out of the healthcare system. I don't want, I, the, what I want is so minuscule that we don't know, need to jump through all these gyrations. What are you worried about? Are you worried about a million dollar cancer treatment? Or I mean, what are you worried about? I'm not worried about any of those things. Like, I, so I don't have any interest in it. So yeah, it's corrupt. It's completely corrupt. It's come yeah. from its core, but it's philosophically, it's, it's, it's not even based in reality. So I don't know why, what you, what yeah. you're fighting for. So back to the personal question. What do you want? What are you afraid of that you're going to need to buy from those phony baloney health peddlers? No, uh, I, I, I mean, nothing would change. Today, I have full freedom. I only use the health options I prefer. Okay. And that's probably because I haven't had any serious health incidents. But if I get cancer, for example, I'm going to go. I'm not going to take, uh, you know, the radiation therapy. But I'm so lucky right. because I can choose because I don't have to pay for this stuff. If you come visit me as a foreigner and you uh, are run over by a car, then you get free health care. If you come here uh, uh, visit me as a foreigner and something more serious happens, 
you get a long term disease you get you get treated for free here so um I don't have to worry about that. So there's a misconception that people in Europe have about the medical system in the United States. Yeah. It's it's not the it's not like that. It's not like if you go if you go get admitted to the hospital, they turn you away because you got in a car accident and you don't have insurance. That's that's just not the case. And the way that it always is, you know, because you're talking about yeah. like uh, on a different level. I don't yeah. know how you process that inside of the medical tyranny where they're going to make people uh, take vaccines that are just. Uh, I, I, we don't know what the hell they are yeah, because we don't know what the virus is. And, you know, back to, if, we re, if we rewind this all the way back to your COVID interviews, yeah. the great thing about your COVID interviews is at the very beginning, you identified this thing as, if not a bioweapon, certainly an engineered uh, a, a virus. And I think that's such an important foundational, fundamental piece to have in place because we can trace through my shows over the year, over this last year, but that became a real hot issue. I interviewed David Icke and he came on and said, there is no virus. And yeah. I love David Icke to, to death. But I, I said, Great David, you, surely you don't believe that they have not isolated the virus, but this has become a hot issue in the alt alt community, and it shouldn't be. It's flat Earth science. And then when you exposed with again your George Webb thing was phenomenal because there's an investigative reporter who starts at that point and then gets back to your thing of the pandemic. You know, it's like are they just taking advantage of? Uh, uh, capitalizing on an opportunity, implementing, accelerating their plan that they already had in place, or is it even more of a of a planned, orchestrated event? Uh, but I'll take all that that I just laid out, and I'll say, now please step mm. back and tell me how you pack that back into how you could ever trust a healthcare system that has put us in this position, how you could ever trust them or, or have any kind of a soapbox to talk about universal healthcare. Fuck that. Let me <laughs> out of it. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I don't see the relevance between how you finance healthcare and the corruption you're pointing out in the, not just the healthcare system, but among it's an ideological collusion basically and it's it's the oligarchs who's behind it but what what on earth does that have to look if they want to force vaccines it's going to happen in america where they don't have universal health care and it's going to happen in norway where we have universal health care it's nothing to do with how you finance it so who gives a shit about universal health care who yeah. the fuck cares how you get there whether the public is financing 80 percent of it over here and the public is financing a hundred percent of it over there I, I see i now understand where you want to take it so i'm going to address that okay i'm going to go to the vaccines but i have to because i'm a i'm your friend have to uh you know uh, open your curtains a little and show you some reality you're not seeing because what's happening now because of the pandemic is that not just individual jobs are lost, industries are destroyed. And it's not just that they are destroyed, they are destroyed by other industries deliberately. For example, the tech industry goes from 100 to 1,000. Whereas, for example, the whole hospitality industry, the whole uh, travel industry, Almost all small jobs, personal businesses, like you started out, all of them are being destroyed, not because of their incompetence or something they did or whatever. It's in forced upon them, no matter if you have universal health care or not. Totally it's, right. It has nothing to okay. do with health care. The result, is, the result is that all those people are without health care because it's tied to their jobs. Not in Europe, because they bought us but off Here, they, uh, As my friend, don't you see the air in your logic? You've bought into this fear-mongering. You've bought into this idea. You've, you've leaped happening. from a couple of important facts. You've leaped from the facts yep. that, That's yes, true. they've destroyed all the, all the jobs that you could potentially have so that they can con completely control your life. But yep. then you've been sold on this idea that what they need to replace that with is health care. And I'm saying health care is the biggest fear-mongering no, no, fucking system no, no. in the world. No, you can't destroy entire lines of businesses and replace it with healthcare. 
first of people need money before they need health. Health is like a secondary concern. I was talking about the hierarchy of needs. And that's what they're doing now. They're removing people's primary and secondary needs. And people are going to fight to get that back. Now, the freedom aspect may get lost in it. I agree with you. If you get the tyranny of um, big pharma, which we already have, by the way, but they are getting stronger in this process, we have to fight that. But that's not, that does nothing. Look, we have to get the jobs back. Freedom is what we have to fight for. And so uh, what's happening now is that the big corporations are totally taking those jobs. I, I think I said to you in one of our conversations, if it wasn't to you, I should have said it because I've said it to others. And that's that I fear that, especially in America, more and more people are working for the corporations because then they will support corporacy because they are dependent upon them. I'd much rather have a libertarian society where small businesses are thriving and not the big corporations. But the state has a role in this because per today the state is in bed with the big corporations. I'm saying give uh, the bed, uh, give the state the bed of the public people so we can, you know, it's from the bottom wealth is created. It's there innovation happens. The corporations are parasites. They can uh, you destroy other businesses, they can take over hostile, they can buy them up, they can do everything, they undermine them with prices, etc. But they can never create, they can never contribute, they can never... Always when somebody do that, it's being swapped up by the bigger ones. So I think you conflate the idea of having the freedom of not worrying about your health with being in some kind of fascist structure where allopathy is shoveled down your throat those are two different things we agree that that's bad and we can avoid that no matter if we finance it like we do in the whole world or if we finance it like in nigeria and usa because it's happening both places and the alternatives are both places too so yeah sign me up for fighting for more sunlight more personal exercise etc but the thing is, people who don't have a home now or a job now or any income now, they need something. Uh, and while we are waiting for that solution to be implemented, they need to survive. And uh, if we were beginning from scratch, it would be so easy. Then we could design like a Ron Paul paradise, right? Like uh, go back a couple of hundred years, not in terms of technology, but in terms of personal freedom. But... We're not there. We are at the. We are at. Uh, it's dramatic energies going on, man. And and to tie that call back to what we begin with, the whole year will be a year of change. And we better keep a tongue straight in our mouth. We better try to keep a clear perspective because we know who will seize upon this chaos. That's the bad guys that we all agree about. And I, I'm telling you, everybody agrees, Alex. The sleepwalkers too. It's just that they think they don't know where the bad things are coming from. So they are tricked into supporting, you know, they're taking the, as a, as a salvation, they are going to take their, their doom. That's how it is. So, but if you can point them to solutions to what they want, like you said earlier in the show, all you want for society, everybody can support it, but they don't understand which solu- uh, where it's coming from. So in crisis like this, you can get people to revolt against the powers that be. They're doing it on the goddamn left. The left who is so loyal to authority, who has been buying into the Russia Gate history all this time, even those people are waking up in the populist left. They woke up before. In the I don't see it. Right? You, because you're not looking enough. But but you're just talking about on one narrow issue that I think they're sideways on anyway. I think the whole no no. The, but you, the, you, you get, know we've spent an hour now. Forward. We've spent all our time talking about an issue that is such a non-issue because again, you know, you say that I'm conflating things. The thing I'm think you're conflating is yeah. our our modern medical establishment. You're conflating that with health, and you know you want to talk about correlation and causation. No fucking way. You'd have to make that case for me over and over again. You know, my personal experience 
with this a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I went because I had a heart condition, you know, something wrong with my heart. So I went, I went through the whole gamut. I went through the medical, the the mainstream medical. I went to the complimentary medical here in, in San Diego. They're just full of shit. And the, the, the only thing that we have now, and people realize this is the only thing we have that improves it is we have uh, more sources of information. So it's not that everyone is full of shit. It's just in order to find the people who are not full of shit, you know, I had to go do my own research. I had to go yeah. find the research that in, in Italy from some doctors who were doing some very unconventional stuff. And then I had to bring it to my fucking healthcare provider and they still shit all over it and said, you know, you're ridiculous unless you take these black box medicines, you know, what are your wife, what's your wife going to say when they haul you off? And I had to tell those people to fuck off and I had to go do it myself. My experience is not different. My experience is everybody's fucking experience. If you go in there, if you expect the healthcare system to provide you health, you're sunk. You're sunk from the beginning. Primary needs. It's more slow's hierarchy of needs. When you don't have money, you don't have job, maybe you don't have family, maybe you are sick because you probably are sick if you live in a city, big city, and are a cog in the system. Those people are uh, at the brink, man. And when that happens, you can reach them with better values. And I just used... Medicare for all as an example that wasn't I didn't even intend to discuss it with you I just said the fact that they are now realizing that everybody is lying to them that they are now fighting like a tea like the tea party it's a movement they're all their own uh, masters yes it's for this issue it could be for any other issue for example UBI or for example uh, against okay. uh, hang on, in, on. India, in India they are demonstrating against the lockdowns uh, I mean a general strike in Paris, there are hundreds of thousands on the streets. Mainstream media is, is censoring this. In London, there's hundreds of thousands on the street. And it's not just one thing they are fighting for, but the main thing is the lockdown. They're against the lockdown. This means citizens are rising up. Some because they want health care. Some because they want the freedom to move about. Some because they are fighting for their jobs. They don't want the corporate takeover because everybody sees what's going on. That's my point. It's an awakening. Not to ev- Look, you want them to come all the way to the thrones where you and me are sitting and judging these plebs, right? <laughs> like two lords. You want them to join our luxury philosophical. Yes, they can do that eventually if they can get the basic rigging and controlling and tyranny uh, over overthrown and 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 make no mistake about it there's much more people realizing what's going on in terms of pandemic and and virus and all that because they're gambling uh, when they pull so dramatic uh, things that makes ordinary people uncertain and afraid they're shaking their paradigm so much that they're they are receptive to, uh, to different to new things that they went i agree so so let let me have a shot at this let me have a shot at this because i I agree with that last part i believe that this is an interesting discussion to have and that is are they overplaying their hand which is the expression i don't know if that translates over in norwegian but like if you play poker and you over bet it somebody's going to call your bluff i get that people are suffering and i get that uh, first of all i get that i live in a bubble Fucking hey, yes, I live in a bubble. Bubble. I've orchestrated my fucking bubble, and I continue to orchestrate it every day. I understand that people are suffering. I understand that people have been intentionally pushed to the brink because they're trying to play that fear game, and they're trying to turn people uh, into these more manipulated. You know, because like you said at the very beginning, this is one of the ways that you play them. You know, you beat them down. And then that's one of the ways to control them is you just beat the fucking shit out of them. And I get it. That's what they're doing now. The, the, the big thing I would call you out on Mm -hmm. is you've fallen for one of the basic fucking tricks, which is to say you you're now empathizing with the beat down people and you're saying, and they won't even give you health care. You need to you need to rise up and get the health care. The health care is part of the fucking problem. It's part of the fucking tyranny that they're trying to create for you to focus on that. And for you to say that person who has been beat down almost to the point where they don't know, like 
This is what I think we're saying. They beat people down, but what they don't realize is that that person is now down so low that you don't know if they're going to accept that handout that you're coming along with mm-hmm. to try and reach them up. Like your phony baloney medical handout, which you know maybe will will pull them over to your side, or if they're going to rise up and say, "Fuck you, fuck your handout." Fuck your medicine. Fuck all your shit. I'm taking my pitch. I'm pitchfork. I'm taking my fucking torch and I'm marching to the castle. Don't hand me any more bullshit fucking medicine or any of the rest of the shit that you think is going to make my life better. I'll tell you what's going to make my life better is you not being around. And when I say you, I mean the fucking system that we've created. Yeah, but are you saying that doctors have no worth, personal physicians they their should. worth is significantly significantly less than we've been led to believe many physicians are whistleblowers now many physicians are trying to go against the big uh, health tyranny being implemented you are aware of that right that we have many allies there's a, think- there's all sorts of individual things you know like you know how many people have died of 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 uh, diabetes during the pandemic yeah. because how many people died because that because they're not getting normal health care because exactly. they're afraid to go into a hospital because they've exactly. convinced everyone exactly. that they're all going to get you. sick well, in the face of this kind of medical disinformation and medical tyranny how you would look to those people as some kind of ally in the battle i i don't understand that they are the biggest fucking part of this thing well let's say you have diabetes then uh, you need uh, uh, a way to get it handled treated even if it's not the best treatment at least you need uh, to survive so that's a good example let's say there's no pandemic and let's say uh, you don't have to you know we pay, it's no such thing as a free health care we pay for our health care here, here in norway everyone State is local. covered that's the whole obamacare thing Everyone is covered here. That's the whole Obamacare thing. Right. They hit up rich people like me a lot. They hit up everybody. It's a shitty system. Nobody likes it. I know. But this I know, idea I know that, that, that into, Americans don't have health care. Yeah, I know you were forced into uh, having to buy into it. Uh, and uh, But then you also bought their explanation that everybody would be covered. I know for sure people are, everybody aren't covered. I know personally people are not covered. And you know, look at the... Uh, look at the numbers but talk with anyone uh it's uh, completely because you know you they have an incentive not to pay out i'll give you a case like like you just mentioned diabetes right great yeah. great example yeah. you know like one of the things uh so like let's take out type 1 diabetes people uh, you know uh, juvenile diabetes people are born and it's horrible and they're gonna have to take insulin their whole life and they're gonna have yeah. to manage it and stuff like that again the the cost of that at this point is not astronomical right i mean we can manage that pretty cost effectively. But take, for example, type 2 diabetes, which is basically just people who are not willing to control their diet. Uh, You know, one of the things I do personally is I do kind of the the fasting, intermittent fasting, you know, I just eat within this five hour, five hour window a day. Very the healthy. effects on that, on type 2 diabetes, are overwhelming, overwhelming. Right. Right. They so swamp any other, quote unquote, medical treatment that I'm like, I don't give a fuck. I don't want to pay for someone to go in and be treated for for type 2 diabetes because they can't control their diet. I don't have to pay for all that. Now, I'll give you some money and you can spend it how you want, but don't tell me that I have to have an infinite deep pocket because you like fucking donuts and fucking hamburgers. Okay, my retort to that would be that now you're actually without realizing it, uh, on the same side as those who want to prioritize allopathy and not the other patties. Because now you're going in and saying, yes, there are two actually options that both will lead to freedom. One is the one you are not uh, in favor of, which is let every healthcare be free and let people choose which one they want to go to. And they don't have to worry about payment. But you are now saying, no, 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 we should, uh, those who have uh, lifestyle diseases, those should be excluded. Well, then we could also say, yeah, well, everybody who needs acupuncture should be excluded. No, it's either or. It's either or. Either everything is on the table and people choose, 
freely uh, according to what they want and what they need, or nothing is in the table. If you just accept some diseases or some or causations or some treatments, then it's being corrupted. But one option is that. The other is what you're saying. Let people choose it by, let, let it be commercial. Let it still be, you know, a business to trade in your health, but give people the resources to finance it, either by having work and conditions to create. It's, no, it's no, always I, a business when people say this. No, it's always a business. Yeah. Somebody always has to get paid. Pfizer's fucking getting paid. I don't know I why people who, who advocate kind of universal health care think Pfizer isn't getting their fucking cut. We haven't got the health care system corrupted in terms of finances. Everything else is corrupted, and we're still a part of the Americanization and the modernization and the materialization. And people get sick. And they get vaccinated and they get 5G. So, of course, we're going to have the same diseases. I'm just saying when we have them, people should have a means to... Actually, they shouldn't have to worry about them. Like today, uh, I don't have to worry, oh, I can't uh, quit my job because of the good healthcare plan. Although I'm miserable in this job and I'm becoming sick precisely because I hate this job. And that's why I need this goddamn healthcare. And that's why I have to stay in that job. Nobody in Norway thinks like that, man. How are we going to wrap this up? We're not wrapping up shit. By the way, you said uh, people are <laughs> overestimating. No, no, people are underestimating the powers that be. I actually think, at least in our bubble, and I'm talking about that bubble that we share, um, I think they're overestimating them. I don't think the powers that be are calculating for the clashback. I think our oligarchs today are dumber than the oligarchs back in, in the day. Because back in the day, they understood the, they have to pacify fo- folks, either by, not, uh, like they do here, Brave New World, have a bubble, play a nut, or by brute force. And uh, America is in between. And I, I, you know, I've said this before, and I say it again. Leonard Cohen, he's a goddamn prophet. He said, it's coming to America first, the cradle of the best and the worst. It's there they've got the range and the machinery for change, it's there they got the spiritual first. And I firmly believe he was right when he said that. And we're seeing it in real time now, and we can't wrap this up without pointing to the fact that if you think you saw changes in 2020, man, brace for 2021. And some of those changes will be good. I'm insisting on that. But yeah, the the shadow is going to be with us still and the grip is going to be firmer for sure but the more they do that the more they are forcing a a, a gut reaction you know you know you know polarity right so push down with one force and the backlash is going to be the same so i'm just saying you know you and me have a big responsibility although we are not reaching as many people as we ought to or we want to we're reaching enough. And you know as well as me, you know, the six degrees of separation, you know about the 12th, uh, the 10th monkey, 100 monkey, I mean, 100 monkey, and you know about one man can change, etc. So, and the butterfly here and the revolution there. So when you and me are navigate, people look to us, many look to us for advice. And at least they want to get their v- v- uh, viewpoints tested. So, that's why it's great that you and me can air disagreements like intelligent gentlemen. And it's also incumbent upon us be be cautious before we conclude and not get too wrapped up in uh, subtracts because we have to have the big picture to navigate through this. Because I do agree with you that the powers that be have clever ways to, you know, manipulate and hijack and distract and all that stuff. So we have to try to keep our tongue straight in the mouth. I, I think you make a really good point. And it's one that, you know, as you were saying it, I was like, shit, he's right. Because I think everything that we're seeing unfolding right now mm-hmm. suggests that they don't have a very good handle on what the fuck they're doing. Mm-hmm. 
I, I don't even say desperation. I think desperation is the wrong word. I think it more, uh, more what what you kind of were alluding to is kind of a fundamental incompetence in in terms of uh, yeah. how to do this stuff. And you you said something kind of really interesting. And uh, you know the oligarchs of our day aren't as good as the oligarchs of uh, the past. And there always is the lens, you know, the Monday morning quarterback, and we're picking and choosing. I don't know that they were ever that good before. But I think there's a fundamental truth to what you're saying. So let me put you on the spot here because we didn't do the 2020 show that I wanted, but we are going to do the prediction aspect of it. Mm. We are, I don't know how close you're following this. And I am so not, uh, it's funny, right at the beginning, you said you're not a 24 hour news cycle guy. I have worked so hard to not be, I will just shut myself off from news and, you know, my friends and family will say something and they'll look at me like, are you a complete idiot? You didn't hear that that happened. <laughs> but this last year I've, I've been forced to be more of in the news cycle. And I'll tell you what I'm in the news cycle on right now, which I think is no doubt going to be one of the fundamental key events of, I don't even want to say 2020 or 2021, because it feels to me like a guy who's lived, you know, a few years now as one of the most f- the fundamental, profound moments of our time. And that's that there's more and more evidence that Trump is going to fight this then all the yeah. way. Yeah. And that he is not going, that, that he is going to probably, you know, he's going to force Biden's hand by threatening, uh, uh, bring him on charges for treason, bring his son on charges for treason, bring his brother on charges for treason. And as well as, you know, arresting a bunch of other people and under the Insurrection Act and basically declaring something close to a a martial law. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying anyone who isn't aware that that option is in play Mm -hmm. and being actively, actively considered at a very serious level and anyone who isn't considering the implications of that, because that's not something you can do halfway. If he goes that way, he will be forced to drain the swamp, something he's been, people have said he's going to do, but I I don't know what to make of Trump because he certainly hasn't drained the swamp uh, yet. No. He's uh, demonstrated as being nothing other than somebody who's in the swamp. Yeah. But if well, he crosses, if he crosses the Rubicon here, he will be forced to play that out because he will be taking that step. Do you think that's going to happen? And what do you think will be the the impact either way, if he does or if he doesn't? Because if he doesn't, what a lot of people are saying is then America is probably going to be very different just in terms of the people that are taking control. Clearly, they have, you know, rigged the election. That uh, back yeah. to our statistics thing, so, you know, the so, best proof of that is just statistics in the same way we say other elections are phony. You know, you can't have 105 percent of the precinct in Wisconsin voting 105 percent. That does it. You know, you can't have that and, and have a, a real legitimate election. So given that we didn't have a legitimate election, who cares? We, we, we had a lot of illegitimate elections. But my point is, if this illegitimate election is allowed to stand, I think what a lot of people are concerned about is how would you ever, you know, how would you ever write the ship after this when you've kind of given the keys to the people? I'm apolitical here, people. I'm not saying one way or another, one is good, one is bad. I just think I'd like you to speak to this moment in history that we're at and which way you think this thing is going to fall. Yeah, I'm going to be a bit more neutral here, I think, because um, like in the financial thing, I have taken a side where which i think is the best working but here i haven't but i can still offer a fair perspective in terms of analysis let me start with using um, russia against against trump as a good example of why i'm saying the current elite is dumber than the previous because the previous had to fight its way against uprising from the people they had to uh, pass they had to deal with world wars they had to deal with the uh, uh, control mechanism tools like hitler running havoc and 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 it's like a dog they were having in a leash who freed himself and started biting them they had to 
deal with the depression. They had to deal with. I'm not saying this is they did, they weren't a part of this. They, they precisely where they were playing. They even managed to phase it from a, a fast a hard currency backed system to a fiat systems, and they've implemented MMT for all its worth. Now, it's because today's elite are inbred more than the one in the past. You know, even Morgan, I think, was fighting himself up from, from nothing. So they are inbred. Yeah, we still have uh, heritage uh, elites, but there's a lot of inbred uh, precisely because we have a lot of uh, inherited elites. It's not people fighting themselves to the top anymore. Even Bill Gates, who people think, first off, he didn't invent shit. He hijacked it. He's a th- thief. Second, Gates, he's from... Uh, all- Not true. I, was, I lived through that whole thing. We can do a whole show on that. But Gates is an oligarch. He was a very good computer programmer. He's born into an elite family. He wasn't like... So even he, even those new rich people we look at aren't really new rich. Yes, he became a, a trillionaire by his own, but he was uh, always a part of the elite. And, so, and also they are... Um, not just in bread, but they are in America especially, but more and more everywhere. The elites have been unaccountable for a long time. They weren't before. The only way an elite is falling now if the, if the other elites are turning against them, which is what they're trying to do with Trump. So uh, you are failing upwards. And this has happened for a long time, I think at least since JFK. But after 2001, it was systematized. You saw that with Obama in 2008. They rewarded the people who did the crimes, banksters, corporations. And look at the, you're saying, how is Trump still is surrounded with the swamp? Look at the, Steve Mnuchin, one of the perpetrators of the 08 recession. You know who was supposed to go after him as public prosecutor? Kamala fucking Harris. Like so many other sins she has on her plate, which is why nobody was voting for her in the primary. So she was elected because she was uh, accepted by Wall Street and the perfect distraction, uh, the Obama card uh, doubling down, not just colored, but this time also female. Well, she was bribed by Mnuchin to not prosecute. And now Mnuchin is the goddamn finance minister. So uh, Trump, he ran on real populism. I, do, I believe parts of it was his own, but he was more concerned about winning and he believed in the populist advisors he had in 16, like Steve Bannon. And so he understood that this is a way to win, or at least uh, it aligned with his interests. And I do believe some populism he, he really believes, like uh, he, ha- he is actually nationalistic. He's always been. Yeah, but Steve Bannon was a coke addict and... and the, uh, Pedo sex nut. If I don't get your prediction on this, I'm going to be really, really disappointed because all that stuff is ancient history. I want no, to know it, it, your I prediction. Know. Look, look, just to, your, your, look to the Northern Lights and okay. tell me. <laughs> London calling. Uh, so here's the thing. Uh, it's, it's relevant because he lost all those people. Mike Flynn, Steve Bannon, who actually helped him win. He did... In 16, he and Bernie ran on populism thing. They actually Trump said universal health care, no problem. He said we're gonna uh, tariff and all that, uh, TSA and all that stuff. Now, in 20, both him and Bernie were running on identity politics because they have horrible advisors. So Trump is left alone in the swamp. So it's not a matter of, you know, if tr- you're right, if Trump is gonna ride this off. It's going to be by actually doing a military uh, takeover. And I, I don't believe he has enough support in the military. Uh, the j- courts is not going to help him. We saw that they're throwing out the case, even though it's his people in the court. They don't have the balls. And uh, yes, it's rigged. I have a, had a program about rigging in 16 already. And uh, I said on Twitter, when people were fighting about, about this, who's going to be the next president, Biden or Trump? I mean, after the election. So not who's going to win with votes, but who's going to actually end up. And I said, you know, one of who's going to end up the winner? The one with the best rigging team. 
And so I, I think Trump's team is more incompetent. I think his uh, enemies are much more organized because they they have uh, the CIA and everyone on board. And I, I, think, I think Trump's uh, allies are a minority within the elite, but they are there. And Trump also has a fair portion of MAGA people who he can't do anything wrong. But Trump has an option now to, for example, uh, let Assange and uh, Snowden go free. And he may do it just as a finger up to Obama. I don't believe he would do it for ideological reasons, but he would do it because he knows the neolibs are, are going to be angry about that. So it's I think it's all up in the air. Trump has always been like a gut guy, who, who a good tactician. He follows his gut in the now. So we re, uh, he could go anywhere. He could go to like... Uh, uh, running again in 2024 and accepting the defeat now and making sure havoc like freeing Assange, pardoning Assange, etc. Or he could go the way that you're talking about. But it's going to be, remember, I think he's also not as brave as some would have him. He's thinking of his own ass. The backlash, if he doesn't get away with it, is very big. And it's too late now to start a hot war. So I don't think he has enough support in the system to do it. If he has, he will do it because he knows that uh, they are coming after him after the election. So, I, I, and I do not believe, I never believed those who said that he will prosecute Clinton, Obama, uh, Biden. They've said it, QAnon have said it for years now. It never happens. And they're always doubling down with the next predicament. And, and it's like in cults. When it fails, instead of saying, that's it, I've had enough, they they fall for the explanations and the rationalizations. And I haven't seen anything of this behind-the-scenes war yet in the deep state. I don't think it's a, a fight behind the scenes. I think it's like 90% are still intact of the deep state. And I think some deep staters and some people in the white system have supported Trump for ideological reasons, not populist reasons, tends to be more nationalistic and even fascistoid reasons. I'm not saying Trump is a fascist because he isn't. If he was, he would have taken this COVID and seized upon it. He would have taken a martial law long ago, like many countries did. He would have done a shock doctrine to implement stuff. Instead, he was fighting of course, because he has, he's in the hotel business and he's being ruined by this. But he was fighting the lockdown and he was wanting, like every man for himself, which is the opposite of fascism. So he's not a fascist, but he does have, like he has fascist enemies and he has fascist ally, allies, actually. And so that's why I can't do a hard prediction, but I can say what I don't believe. I do not believe he will go after the big power players because he knows... The, the, it's, they're too powerful and, and I'm not saying Biden is powerful Biden is just a puppet like all the other pol politicians actors basically the real powers are in the hands of the banks and the corp multinational corporations because we live in a corpocracy folks we don't live in socialism we don't live in capitalism we live in corpocracy which in cultural and identity politics tends to be more left or right here and there but, but that bottom line that's it and Trump alone cannot fight that, and I, my okay. My, I I tend to think Biden will take over, and uh, the swamp will be reinforced. Yes, they're still strong, uh, but it's going to be same boss as before. It's just going to be a new face. That's what one of the reasons they hate Trump because he doesn't put a pleasant face on the machine. Uh, Biden and Obama certainly does but in in terms of actions um i think i think it will be a turn for the worse but i think it will be balanced by people uprising on different areas uh, when they uprise against uh lockdown that they do all over the world now national strike national strike is one of, general strike is one of the left to uh, last tools we have left i was trying to say earlier but when that happens i think well, we can contain some of the worst shit coming down on us from the politicians. 
Uh, and uh, if uh, Trump actually goes the way you're saying, it's going to be ugly because he won't uh, make a populism regime. It will be like some kind of Bolsonaro Brazil thing or Victor Urban in Hungary, which is more or less na- national, w- one state nationalist regime. And then you can discuss is it going to be worse or better than what you got now. <laughs> I can't see how things can be much worse. But maybe it will actually be better. But that's what you're going to get. Uh, but I hope what will happen is that people rise up, which they will do on different areas. And you you don't smack it down because the left and the right, you know, when a left, left goes out on the street, Black Lives Matter, stuff like that, against the police, the right says, oh, oh no, no, fuck it. This is... Uh, uh, we're against this. When the right goes out in the streets, like against the mosques or whatever, then the leftists are coming in and poo-pooing that. And as long as people don't just realize, look, we're all pissed, we have to get on the streets with orange vests until we take over the democratic institutions. Until that happens, big structural changes won't happen. So for 2021, I think the most changes would happen in the grassroots I think it, you will see lots more demonstrations, fights, strikes, um, yeah, different kind of populism uprisings, uh, and more, much more. Int- I think you and me will see more listeners coming to us. The independent will grow. The independent, independent will grow, or the alt, alt as you call it. Uh, but the huge structural changes, well, they can happen overnight, but. I can't see ending 2021 with, let's say, a Biden regime and still having a COVID problem and uh, maybe even being closer to a mass mass vaccination. But more people than ever will have uh, awakened, man. And that will be so encouraging for us all because it's not because it's not about what system do we live in. It's about how many people accept the system we live in. And when we have the majority. um Changes is going to happen, man. You know, I, I wish I could. We could deconstruct that, which we would have to. But we just don't have the time to do it. But I think your analysis of uh, of Trump is very, very nuanced and very, very insightful in in a lot of ways. All right, my friend, our guest, our guest again has been the fantastic Al Borealis. Check out Forum Borealis. I'll obviously have links in the show and don't think this is going to be the end of this conversation there's too much great stuff that we didn't have a chance to talk about so we'll have to do it again real soon and see how this 2021 prediction of his uh kind of plays out so al my friend thank you very much merry christmas happy new year you're the best buddy i really appreciate you and great winter solstice to you Thanks again to Al for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I guess I tee up is the one that we spent so much time on, and not that I think either one of us anticipated it, but it kind of led to an interesting discussion on a number of levels, and that is, what do you make of universal health care? Do you see that more as a fundamental right that might give us a little port in the storm in these very uncertain and fear generating times or do you see it as just another and maybe even a primary tool of control by a increasingly engineered society at least that's how i'd tee up that question i'd be super interested to hear your answers to it let me know what you think So I did, after we wrapped up this interview, I did talk to Al about doing this end of year show, which we originally planned on doing. So we're now trying to arrange that. I think absolutely terrific to do with Al, since I have so much respect for not only his show, but his very deep thinking on a lot of different uh, topics. So hopefully we can put that together I also have a bunch of other shows coming up, so please stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care, and bye for now. 